Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. It's behind me on the screen. The word of the Lord today reads, What shall we say then that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. I want to read that to you again. I want that line to sink in. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Verse 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth who? The ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man, unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. This is a powerful, powerful portion of Scripture. Let's go to the Lord before I deliver this word this afternoon. Father, once again, God, we come boldly before the throne of grace as the Word of God declares it is our sacred privilege as children of the Most High God. Lord, we come before you today in faith. We come before you today, God, with no false notions of any holiness or righteousness or godliness possessed of us that originates with us or that resides within us. But we come before you today, God, understanding that all our righteousness is as filthy rags. And Lord, today, the righteousness that you desire, the righteousness that you recognize, the righteousness that will allow us access to glory, is a righteousness which is born of faith and not works. Master, today unleash the Holy Ghost at this hour. Anoint the messenger of God and anoint those today that would hear the message. Allow the Holy Ghost from heaven to open our ears, open our minds, open our hearts, and help us to understand the powerful truth that you've given me to share with the people of God today. Master, in the name of Jesus, reveal yourself. Be today, God, for the lost a Savior. Be today, God, for those who have wandered away from the faith, a reconciler and a restorer. Be today for those who are sick, a healer. For those who are captive and bound today, God, be a deliverer. Send forth your word to do the work. Oh, Master, we ask it all in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. amen. Praise God and amen. The Apostle Paul tells the saints at Rome that Abraham taught us a lesson. The life and the experiences of Abraham taught us this, that righteousness is not born of works. Honestly, if you look at the life of Abraham, 
He was a good man. He was a godly man. But he was also a human. <laughs> he did some really dumb things. He did some really foolish things. There were times when God called upon Abraham to walk and live by faith. For instance, when he came to him at an old age and said, By the way, you're going to be a daddy. I'm going to give you a son, and that son will come through Sarah. He specified, Sarah's going to bear a child. And yet, Sarah was unsure of this promise of God, and so was Abraham. Something about, you know, be careful who you hook your wagon to, folks. Be careful who you get married to and who you get involved with. Look what happened to Adam and Eve. Look what happened to Abraham and Sarah. Sarah thought, well, I'm too old for this. Uh, you know, you need to go in and lay down with my handmaiden, and she'll bear you a son. Well, Abraham did, and he did. There was a son born. The only problem is that isn't what God said. Honey, I got news for you. When God says he's going to move two degrees to the right, he don't mean he's going to move one degree to the right. He certainly don't mean he's going to move two degrees to the left. When God says I'm going to do it this way, he's going to do it that way. But isn't it funny, even though Abraham unleashed a trouble in our world that exists even to this day between the Arab and the Israeli people, the Jewish people. Even though Abraham disobeyed and disbelieved God, somehow or another we don't see that celebrated when we talk about Abraham. When we read of the people of Israel, we're told that they are the people of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. Abraham is esteemed highly. Abraham is thought of as the father of many nations, the father of a great race of people. We don't dwell on his humanity. We don't dwell on his failings and his frailty and his sin, his unbelief. No, we learn through Abraham that righteousness before God is not about how we do things and how well we do it and whether or not we're able to, quote, toe the line or not. Abraham, the Word of God says, uh, learned that righteousness before God comes by faith. It was about Abraham's faith. It was about his relationship and his walk with God and not about how perfect he is. We got preachers in the world today that will tell you that if you're gay, bless God, you can't get into heaven. You can't live for God. You can't be a Christian unless you somehow can fix yourself. You can somehow deliver yourself. You can somehow change yourself. Well, I got news for you, preacher. You're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. Righteousness is not born of works. It is born of faith. Hallelujah to God. It's never been because the minute it falls into our hands, the minute that responsibility falls into our lap, and righteousness is dependent on, upon our actions, our conduct, our behavior, there would not be one single person saved. Not a soul. Word of God said all our righteousness, all our righteousness, all of the righteousness which we manufacture. And listen to the language the Apostle Paul used. He said all our righteousness is as a filthy rag. It's an interesting statement. Somebody's sitting back right now and they're saying, really? Because I don't see it. I don't see why that's so interesting. Well, I'll tell you why it's interesting. Because Paul is saying, in effect, righteousness is a covering. Righteousness is what we clothe ourselves with. Paul is saying, that when we try to clothe ourselves with righteousness of our own manufacture, of our own device, of our own works, our own actions, our own deeds, he said, we look dirty and unclean before God. We look like somebody that wore the dirtiest, ugliest clothes we could find. 
Oh my goodness, how do you like that? You see, righteousness is a covering. Righteousness is a cloak. We literally, by faith, put on the robe of righteousness before God so that it conceals what is genuinely going on within. Oh my goodness. The Apostle Paul said that sin is always present with us. Always. Do you remember how that Moses, as he led the children of Israel uh, out of Egypt, he went before Pharaoh and one of the miracles that God caused Moses to be able to perform, he would place his hand within the breast area of his garment, behind his garment, right? And he would pull out his hand. And what was wrong with his hand when he pulled it out? It was leprous. Leprosy is something God has used for many, many, many centuries to represent sin and decay. Then he would put his hand back under that garment and pull it out and it would be whole. It would be healed. Every time Moses, oh hallelujah, I hope you're getting this today. Every time Moses would reach under his garment and bring forth his hand and reveal that leprosy, what God was demonstrating was, no matter what you look like on the outside, when you go behind the covering, there is sin. That's why David the psalmist, David the king of Israel said, in our primary text today, uh, verse number 6, Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man, unto whom God imputeth righteousness, without works imputeth righteousness. In other words, God gives you credit for righteousness without your having done a thing in the world to earn that. You didn't do anything to call yourself righteous. But listen, verse 7, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. See, that robe of righteousness covers our sin. The sin never goes away. That's why John said in his epistles to the church, the Apostle John said, If we say that we have no sin, we make God a liar and the truth is not within us. That's why the Apostle Paul told us, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He was not talking about unbelievers. He was talking about believers. Unbelievers are not trying to bring God glory. Unbelievers are not living their lives to glorify God. Believers are. Paul said, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. No matter how you slice it, Paul said, sin is always ever present in us. That sin is always behind the robe. But God has covered us with righteousness that we didn't earn and we don't deserve, but that Jesus Christ was able to sow on the cross of Calvary. Hallelujah. And I believe he used the material from the, uh, the curtain that used to separate the Holy of Holies, the veil, in the temple. You remember in the Word of God as Jesus was being crucified, the veil of the temple was rent in twain. It was torn in half. I believe God did that because He needed material to sow with. Hallelujah! And He said, I've got to make some robes of righteousness. What used to separate the people of God from their God is now brought down. And I'm going to use that same separating material to separate the people from their sin. When I look at them, I will not see their sin. I will see only righteousness, which is achieved and maintained by faith. Because human beings are not capable of manufacturing any covering that is sufficient 
to hide from God's view what is genuinely going on inside of us. Amen? Amen. The Word of God says today in Genesis chapter 3, verses 6 through 8, as well as verse 21. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. It's another word you can use here. Uncovered. And they sewed fig leaves together. And made themselves aprons. Oh, so they tried to do something to cover themselves. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Jumping down to verse 21. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them. Their covering was inadequate. God said, no, those little fig leaves, that, that's not going to work for me. I can still see things that I'm not comfortable seeing. I can still see things I'm not happy looking at when I look at you. No, you need a different covering. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? And the Word of God said He gave them coats of skin. I've got news for you. You go into the Hebrew, you'll find out that that word skins here literally has as part of its definition flesh. It's not merely a matter of skin, the epidermal layer. No, it is flesh flesh. They went from being a spiritual being in the image of God. They went from being a living soul uh, created in the image of God to being flesh and blood just like the animals. Now, the Bible said, in the day that thou eatest of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt surely die. Now, death became not only a possibility for them, but it, beca it became inevitable for them. Because now their existence had changed, their nature had changed. They were now clothed upon, their spiritual man was now clothed with a flesh and blood body. When we read in the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis, that they were naked, we often think that Adam and Eve were running around with their private parts dangling and swinging throughout the Garden of Eden. And Mom, quit laughing. I know I just made my mother laugh with that one. But that is not the case. They were spiritual beings. The Word of God tells us plainly, God breathed into Adam's nostrils, and Adam became a living soul. Adam was created in the image of God. The Word of God tells us God is not a man. God is not flesh and blood. He did not create Adam in flesh and blood. He created Adam as a living soul, a spiritual being that had the ability to live forever. I remember growing up as a kid, I used to ask questions in Sunday school. How is it that Adam and Eve could be created flesh and blood, and yet they were supposed to be able to live forever? Oh, I heard answers from pastors. I heard answers from Sunday school teachers. Every answer I ever heard, and there are people out there right now probably hearing me, and they're getting all offended, and they're saying, Oh, no, preacher, what you're saying now ain't right. That don't make sense. And they're, they're getting all carried off. Uh, don't get ahead of yourself. Let me finish my message and see if it doesn't come together for you. I heard, well, they, God had a bubble over the, the garden, and it protected them from all the different elements. And, well, you know, there was a special protection over them. Well, you know, God is... And every explanation I heard, they could not point to one passage of Scripture to support what they were saying. Every single explanation I heard, Tommy, 
was conjecture. It was just imagination. It was, you know, something they, they conjured up in their own thinking. Um, I have a problem with that because I'm of the belief, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. That's how God said he shows us things. I believe scripture answers scripture. You don't find an answer to a question about the word of God outside of the word of God. You don't find it in your reasoning. You don't find it in your imagination. You find it in the word of God. So years later, I was praying and searching and studying, and all of a sudden, God showed me this, I believe. Now, i got news for you. If you don't believe what I'm saying today, you're not going to go to hell because you don't believe it. And I'm not trying to start a new denomination that believes something a little bit different. No. I, listen, you can look at it as my theory, and if you don't want to believe it, don't believe it. It doesn't, make a, it doesn't make a hoot owl's worth of difference in whether or not you make heaven if, if you understand and believe what I'm saying. There are a lot of things in the church, folks, that have no bearing on your salvation whatsoever. People say, oh no, every single little thing you believe is going to affect your salvation. Well, my God, there we go. Back to works, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. No, there are people who will argue the Word of God says in the Old Testament, God created a great fish to swallow up Jonah. In the New Testament, Jesus said that he was swallowed by a whale. Which was it? A great fish or a whale? Because a whale is not a great fish. A whale is a mammal, not a fish. I've heard people get into arguments over this, literally. Is it going to affect your salvation one way or the other? Not a drop. Not a drop. It ain't going to make a word's worth of difference. There are people who want to argue about whether or not Jesus was crucified on a cross or whether he was crucified on a stake. Because after all, if it was only a stake, then, you know, well, no, it doesn't make a hoot owl's worth of difference. The bottom line is Jesus was crucified. The Bible calls it a cross. The Romans, we know for a fact, used a cross similar to what we see, not maybe not altogether perfectly what we see. And we can get off into all kinds of arguments about this. It doesn't affect your salvation one single bit. But listen, the covering that Adam and Eve created for themselves was not sufficient. It did not do for them what God wanted it to do for them. Therefore, God himself made coats of skins and clothed them. It's so funny because, again, growing up as a kid, I was always told, Oh, this was a type of the first animal sacrifice. Where do you read that God killed any animals to give them a covering of skins or a covering of flesh? Where, where does it say God killed anything? Did Adam and Eve, did they, did they get the skin of a cow? Because I can't imagine Adam and Eve running around with big old black spots on them, white spots on them. You know, did, did the Lord give them the skin of a pig? No, think about it for a minute. The Word of God tells us that there's different kinds of flesh. There's the flesh of animals, and there's the flesh of fish, and there's the flesh of birds. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. Humanity has an entirely different kind of flesh. So what animal did God kill in order to give them a covering? Let's continue today. I've got this covered, God said to Adam and Eve. I've got this covered. I'll give you a covering that will do for you what I want it to do. In Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 and 13, listen. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Verse 13, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, listen carefully, but all things are naked and opened 
unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. The only coverings which serve their purpose are those coverings which God himself provides. Our spiritual ills, our sins, wickedness are actually covered. They are concealed within our flesh. Your sin is not in what you do. Listen to me, children. Your sin is not external. Your sin has nothing in the universe to do with your actions and your behaviors. Oh, my goodness. There are going to be people who are mainstream fundamentalists. They're, they're going to spit their teeth out of their head right now. Listen carefully to what I'm about to say. Our sin, the real sin, is not in our actions, but rather it is in that evil which inspires the action. Our sin is spiritual. Therefore, it originates within us. That's why Jesus said, it's not what goes into a man that defiles a man, but what comes out of the man. It originates within us. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? It originates within us. So the sin is not so much in the lie. The sin is not so much in the murder. The sin is not so much in the lust. The sin is not so much in the adultery. It's in what motivated us to commit that act? Because what motivated us to commit that act is a spiritual thing. And the Word of God tells us that all things, all creatures are naked and opened unto the eyes of Him with whom we have to do. So even though it's covered, God can still see it. The only way it can be covered so that God doesn't see it, oh, I hope you're hearing me today, is if God provides the covering. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The only way your sin can be covered today is if God provides that covering. Go back to verses 7 and 8 of our primary text today. Saying, blessed are these whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Hallelujah. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. When God has provided our covering through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and obedience to His gospel, then my friend, God no longer sees our sin. He sees us as righteous. Why? Because we have put on ourselves Christ's righteousness by faith. But, here's good news. One day, and I believe it will be fairly soon, God will transform our bodies back into a living soul. Clothed, excuse me, clothing our spirit in a spiritual flesh that cannot pass away. Hallelujah. The day is coming when God is going to restore humanity to that exact place that Adam forfeited in the Garden of Eden. And we will have flesh, but it will not be human flesh it will be spiritual flesh. Listen to me now. Somebody said, oh, pastor, now you're really going off the rails. No, I'm not. If you would just, if you would just let the word of God speak to you today. 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 4. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, Eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring, listen, to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found, what? Naked. Paul just said, if this body were dissolved and all that remained were our spiritual man, 
All that remains is your spirit. You'd be naked. That's what he said. He said, that's why we groan. We long to be clothed upon. With what? With our spiritual body. What is the spiritual body? It is what we call the soul. The soul is a spiritual body. God has a spiritual body. People say, no, God didn't have a spiritual body. Sure he does. Sure he does. He told Moses, he said, I'm going to hide you up here in the cleft of the rock, and I'm going to walk through the valley. And when I take my hand away, take your what? Take my hand away. Oh, God, you don't have a hand. You're a spirit. Hello now. He said, I'll let you see the back of me. Wait a minute, Lord. How can Moses see the back of you? You have no body. Sure he does. A spiritual body. That's why God created man in his own image, a living soul. If you read in the word of God, you will see times when God says, my soul. He refers to my soul, my spiritual flesh, my spiritual being. This is why I say Adam and Eve were created in the garden of living soul. Literally created in the image of God. Instead of going through all these calisthenics that most theologians go through. Well, that means God created us as a, a spiritual being, but he created us in, you know, in a flesh body. That's not what it says. It says God created man in his image, a living soul. He breathed into Adam's nostrils, and Adam became a living soul. That tells me that if I'm created in the image of God, and I'm created a living soul, then God must be what? A living soul. What then is the soul? Because the Bible tells us that God is a spirit. So what then is the soul? We get people in certain cults, in certain religions, in certain uh, false teaching. They get all carried away. The church over the centuries has made a false claim. And that is that every man possesses a soul. That every human being possesses a soul. And that when we die, your soul goes to heaven and your soul goes to hell. No, that is incorrect. The Word of God also said, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Isn't that what it says? Mm -hmm. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Well, so guess what? When we read in the, in the New Testament about Jesus descending into hell during his burial, during the time he was in the tomb, listen carefully. The Word of God said that he preached unto the spirits not souls so what's in hell is something in hell are people in hell oh yes they are but what part of them is in hell they are in hell naked they are in hell unclothed they are in hell without a spiritual body do you follow me now all that's there is their spiritual man therefore they are in effect naked they have no covering whatsoever are you following me today? Isn't this pretty interesting when you think about it? Amen. Now listen, let's continue. I'm not done. Almost, but not quite. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed. Paul said, we're not groaning, we're not burdened by the fact that our spirit is in a body. But he said, but clothed upon. We don't want to be unclothed. We don't want to be without anybody. He said, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Our faith in this life provides a covering for our sin. At the time of the rapture, the resurrection, we shall be changed and made in reality into that perfect sinless creature that we have only until then seen and embraced by faith. When we stand before the Lord in the judgment, we will not stand as the unbeliever stands naked, uncovered, unclothed. 
with all our sin glaringly obvious. But rather we shall stand as perfected, shining, glorious, victorious children of God. Hallelujah. Because our faith in this life secures us a sinless, perfect body created in the image and likeness of God, a living soul. Hallelujah. What brings life to the soul, the spirit. It's like those little toys the Russians used to have, you know. They almost look like people, and you open one, and there's a little guy, what's it called? Russian dolls. Yeah, the Russian doll. You open one, and there's a little one inside. You open the other there. That's why the Word of God teaches there are three aspects of the human being. There's body, soul, and spirit. You have a spiritual body, even as an unbeliever in this life, but it is not living. That's why we need the Holy Ghost. The Spirit of God breathes life into our spiritual man. So the person who dies and winds up in a devil's hell is going to wind up there soulless. That's why the Word of God said that hell is called the second death. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. It's not going to have the opportunity to live. You say, in effect, it's, it's, you might say it's stillborn. Because at the moment of death, when your spiritual man should be birthed and go into glory, instead, your spiritual man, your spirit will be released, but there'll be no soul with it. So therefore, that sinner, the unbeliever, is going to their eternity without a soul. They're simply, their spirit is being released. So they can be part of the kingdom that they wanted to be part of in this life. Now listen, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 35 through 49. Listen carefully. I think most of this is self-explanatory. But some will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Thou fool, Paul writes, that which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain. It may chance of wheat or some other grain. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. So Paul says, now isn't it funny, people can't understand. In, in his day you had the Sadducees and the Pharisees. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection and the Sadducees did not. We still got Sadducees in our world today. They don't believe the dead can uh, be born again and raised to new life. They don't believe in a spiritual existence after death. Paul said, well, don't you understand? When you bury a seed in the ground, you're not burying something that looks like what it's going to look like when it grows. You're burying something that looks entirely different. It, it doesn't even begin to resemble what you're going to grow from that seed. No, the seed has one appearance, it has one flesh. Then he said, as it grows, it takes on a whole different appearance, a whole different flesh. He said, the same thing is true when we die. Now listen, he continues, But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. Verse 39, All flesh is not the same flesh. But there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. Now listen, for those of you that wanted to think I was being a little goofy earlier. There are also, verse 40, 1 Corinthians 15, so you can look it up. There are also celestial bodies. And bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the celestial is one. And the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun. And another glory of the moon. And another glory of the stars. For one star 
differeth from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. Listen. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. I think I just proved to you that there's such a thing as a spiritual body. But listen, it is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, he continues in verse 44, 1 Corinthians 15. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. Now listen to this. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. Meaning a spiritual body possessed of a spirit. The spirit of God. God breathed into Adam's nostrils. Thus imparting a portion of himself into Adam. And Adam became a living soul. Then he continues. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Notice the last Adam was not made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. What do you need a spirit to quicken? The soul. Adam was made a living soul. Adam disobeyed God, lost his place in paradise, lost his, uh, his spiritual condition, which would have enabled him to live forever on the earth. And now Christ came, the second Adam, the last Adam, to become a quickening spirit so that once again he could breathe life into the soul of man. Do you follow me? And at the resurrection of believers, guess what happens? You are going to come from the grave. Your spiritual body will literally be transformed. Uh, your physical body will be transformed into a spiritual body. You're not merely going to leave your natural body behind. No, your natural body has to come because there's a transformation that takes place. Just like the seed. You don't plant the seed in the ground and then somehow or another wheat just grows and the seed stays there. Do you follow what I'm saying? No. The seed has within it all of the DNA, all of the layout for the plant that is to grow. Our natural body is designed after our spiritual body. That's why the Word of God said that after the uh, rapture, after the resurrection, we shall be known even as also we were known. You're not going to look different. You're not going to be a different person. No, your spiritual man and your, nat your natural man, your physical man, are designed after one another. Do you follow what I'm saying? As so it was written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. How be it that was not first which is spiritual, or of spirit, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth earthy, the second man is the Lord from heaven. I hope you understand, when you say the Lord from heaven, you're saying God. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. As we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Hallelujah. In this life, we have a fallen nature born of man's disobedience. We have a flesh and blood nature. And in this nature, we have the ability to sin and disobey God and displease God. We have the ability to do things in this body that we ought not to do. God says, that's all right. I've got this covered. I've 
got this covered. Calvary, there's an old song that says, Calvary covered it all. Hallelujah. It says, oh, I made this robe for you that you can embrace by faith. It's my righteousness that I demonstrated. It's my righteousness that I possessed when I walked on planet Earth. But I'm going to give you a robe made of my righteousness so that when I see you, I see you today. The Word of God said, God calls those things which be not as though they were says, I look at you today, and do you know what I see? I see what I'm going to see after the rapture. I see what I'm going to see after you've been redeemed. I see what I'm going to see after the resurrection. But at the resurrection, no longer will you be covered with this robe, but no, I'm going to change your covering. I'm going to change it entirely. You're going to put off that flesh. You're going to put off a natural existence and you're going to be restored to that existence that Adam and Eve knew prior to the fall. Living souls. That's why the word of God says that our soul will live forever. Do men have souls? Yes, they do. Is every man's soul alive? No. Every man that is born in sin and shaped in iniquity, every man and woman and boy and girl that has not believed and obeyed the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ possesses within them a soul that is without life. Will that soul ever see life or will that soul be stillborn? It will probably be stillborn unless they obey and believe the gospel. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Is there such a thing as hell? Yes. Is there such a thing as eternal punishment? Yes. Jesus said there was. Will there be souls of men in hell? No. Will there be spirits of men in hell? Yes. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? See, this thing ain't so hard. Even a good Jehovah's Witness ought to be able to understand this if they let the Word of God speak to them instead of the watchtower. Let's continue in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's go down to verse 50. We, we went through verse 49, but now we're going to go 50 through 57 and I'll be done. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on, put on, put on in corruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. Remember Paul used the phraseology, clothed, we're clothed with the spiritual body. So when this corruptible shall have put on in corruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. We're going to be changed. Glory to God. God's going to change my suit. God's going to change my covering. Hallelujah. That which wraps around my spiritual man is going to be changed so that it's turned inside out. So that my spiritual man now is external and visible. Amen. It is sinless. It is pure. It is everything that Adam was at creation. A living soul that will never die. That's why we sing the song in the church where the soul never dies. Hallelujah. To Canaan's land I'm on my way where the soul never dies. The darkest night he'll turn today where the soul never dies. There'll be no sad farewells. 
there'll be no tear dimmed eyes for all is love and peace and joy where the soul never dies hallelujah glory to god aren't you excited today to know that god speaks to us as believers today and tells us i've got this covered amen hallelujah mm -hmm. i've got this covered in this life i've got this covered in the life to come god says i've got this covered flesh and blood can inherit the kingdom of god but i've got this covered hallelujah aren't you glad today would you stand with me amen praise the